Hi, I'm Lisa Dalton and welcome to Michael Chekhov Master's Talk and we are talking with Sara Lovett. Uh, this is part two of our conversation and, um, and so Sara, share a little bit about who you are and also in our last conversation you mentioned you had started doing some reading on Michael Chekhov and maybe you can update us on that. Sure, yes. Um, I I'm currently writing my dissertation through Pacifica Graduate Institute and the question that I'm focusing on is um, self-care and the actor and do embodiment practices aid um, in their self-care. So one of the things I'm really looking at are different um, approaches that actors use um, such as Chekhov or Meisner and uh, Stanislavski. So looking at each individual one to see um, how that contributes to um, the personal care, if it does, as well as the obviously character development and the actor's work. So um, meeting Lisa and talking about um, the Chekhov technique in our last session, I did some further reading, reading to the actor and going over what we had discussed last time um, and also doing a lot of reading on different techniques the one thing that stands out for me um, with Chekhov is that uh, it is as centered on the I as it is on the you or the character that's being played. And I think, um, at least for me, um, when I'm thinking in terms of being the actor on the stage, um, I want to know I'm held in a safe container, not just the stage, but in the container of the body itself. And um, that's something I'm really uh, loving about the reading and the talk that we had last time about, um, about Chekhov and, and the way that he uh, invites into the body and then invites out of the body again, so. That's my, my interest with this, uh, with this wonderful man. Where we left off was um, talking about spirit and soul and what, how you are defining spirit and soul, how it applies to, to the work. So I was just, I was curious as if we could talk just a little bit about that. Yes, that's a perfect place to pick up from. Um, one of the things that we hear Mr. Chekhov speak very specifically about in uh, in the audio series on theater and the art of acting is a distinction that he makes between the spirit and the soul. And he references the soul as uh, the, that part of our being that amalgamates uh, experiences, that gathers, mm. uh, that collects experiences. And from a uh, spiritual scientific perspective that Mr. Chekhov was a, you know, a devotee of, which was Rudolf Steiner's spiritual science, that collecting of experiences uh, would be of what, what Chekhov is referring to as the psychology psyche from the word soul um, which includes the thinking forces, the feeling forces, and the will forces of the human being so that um, they, uh, they, they have desires and they have you know, thought processes and they have emotional experiences on lower and higher levels. Mm -hmm. So uh, they collect these experiences and process them and then in, in an afterlife, review them, and they would, they would then lead to a karmic flow that is sort of recollected on your way back into an incarnation um, uh, that starts to influence. So when we talk about soul and we talk about experiences, we would be speaking of not just present life experiences. Uh, we would be speaking of uh, a collection of of things that uh, of experiences of thoughts feelings and desires over a great period of time and the, the spirit and the soul this soul uh has uh, literally feels the pain and it feels the yearning and it feels uh the desires 
and it's uh, something that we share with animals, meaning not we don't share our soul with animals, but that unlike the plant kingdom or the mineral kingdom, uh, the animal has the ability to uh, have a certain kind of memory, ha have a certain kind of um, uh, cognition that is, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm in pain, I hurt, I'm lonely. Uh, Elephants in particular, for example, can actually literally die of loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very, very sensitive and uh, emotionally and socially sensitive. And so this, this desire for social acceptance and things like that all comes out of that soul realm. Mm -hmm. And um, what the animal does not have is an individual, uh, an individuality. And that's what each human has. So, so going back to the ele elephant as an example, their, their whole species mm. has sort of an aggregate soul. And, but each individual, you could say, is its own species. Mm. It's, it, it's got its own soul. And that soul um, has a, a sense of continuity and a stream. And, uh, and but what gives us our individuality, uh, our I, which can be either a capital I for individuality, can also be um, the I of, of um, you know, this, as sort of a, you know, this kind of I, you could say, uh, as a higher I, a, a witness, a, an objective part of you that sees um, you from from an objective perspective that is aware of your fallacies and your wonderfulnesses and has the ability to unite all the experiences of the soul and um, that are sort of gathered and collected and be able to extract from the those experiences a certain kind of wisdom a certain kind of insight a certain kind of awareness the ego awareness the individuality and that i mr Chekhov says and it, and like i said it's so very clear in in these audio cassettes that i referenced john abbott recorded that stella adler listened to many times um and and um sorry um, that John Abbott recorded and Stella Adler listened to many times and that um, he, where he speaks really specifically about the power of the higher ego, which is this spirit. And where that Mr. Chekhov is talking about the higher ego, he is talking about this creative individuality Mm -hmm. And this, uh, which has this unique perspective and it's, it's central gift or power, you could say, <laughs> we were talking about having certain powers, right? <laughs> it's power is that it allows you to synthesize mm -hmm. and, um, and unite. It is the uniting power. It's the power he suggests that allows you to look at a feeling of the whole and extract a higher observation of it it's the power that allows you to sort of arise beyond your emotional perspectives beyond your logic forces and express a creativity that is absolutely uniquely yours it's the power which allows every actor who plays Ophelia or Hamlet to play them in a, it, it, a to play them as he says, unlike the other. Mm -hmm. And this concept of being unlike the other is one of the core presences you could say in all peak performance. Mm -hmm. it, it happens when, uh, when it happens, when this uh, creative individuality fully manifests it is so unique 
that the polarity occurs instantly of it having absolute universality so that everyone recognizes the moment we recognize it in any work of art whether that work of art is a painting a sculpture um, you know a, a song a piece of music uh, or a performance of any kind of dance uh, and acting that it it is so uniquely that artist's expression. Mm -hmm. It could not be done by anyone else. And the, in that instant when that person has so connected with their true higher eye and allowed it to flow through the physical form into an artistic expression, um, that, that it is instantly recognized by everyone who experiences it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that wonderful sort of polarity Mr. Chekhov talks about frequently in the work it becomes present in this moment in that absolute individuality is absolute universality. Mm. Yeah. It has such a, a kind of objectiveness to it. Mm. Objectivity as opposed to subjectivity. The soul, you could say, is very subjective. Mm -hmm. uh, and the spirit has this higher objectivity. Yeah. So almost like tapping into a collective unconscious, something archetypal that we all instantly go, ah, oh, and, and we recognize that. Mm -hmm. and, that's um, it. Yeah. yeah. I would say you're, that's right. Mm. Lovely. Um, there were, you spoke of ego and there was one sentence, um, that caught my attention, well, many, many in, in the book, but um, I wondered if you could just speak to this. Um, he's, he writes, the deeply hidden and nowadays almost completely forgotten desire of every true actor is to express himself, to assert his ego through the medium of his parts. I wonder if you could talk about to that, expressing the ego through the character. So this is where he is really talking about that higher ego. Mm, okay. And um, and definitely not that everyday lower personality ego. Okay. And that's one of the special sort of tricks to really understanding and from a contemporary perspective what Mr. Chekhov was saying, mm. because uh, the those. Uh, two of the biggest concepts that get misunderstood is when he uses the word psychology and the others when we, he uses the word ego because in our contemporary vernacular ego means egotistical it, it often means egotistical or self-oriented identity of the everyday personality mm -hmm. uh, it, it's associated with personality mm -hmm. and the relationship of the personality to that to who i am Mm -hmm. And uh, it's I, you could say, with a lower, lowercase I, or mm -hmm. ego with the lowercase e. And he really is speaking about that creative spirit mm -hmm. there. He is talking about the higher ego and that um, one of the studies that we have from his time his period in lithuania and latvia in the early 30s he there's a series of drawings about uh, what i call the goblet series and in that series he draws basically he forms from the foundation to the stem to the arms of the goblet to the filling of the goblet a metaphor or a plan you could say for training um, which starts with the foundation of who you are, the grounds, um, the, the base of the goblet is who you are, what you have. Mm -hmm. And that includes your lower ego. It includes your training, your experience, your genetic talents, your skill sets, everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there is, uh, and we spoke last time and, and you've read in, and to the actor, he speaks of this independent existence of the image, mm -hmm. that images exist in this collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, um, and these images have a yearning to be expressed. Mm -hmm. 
so the images are up here and the and we are as a as an artistic human down here with this base and we need to bri bridge this gap mm. of being able to give expression we need to locate these um images if you will and then be able to extract or choose the best one and then we need to be able to convey it to the audience so the the actors most fundamental task is to convey images to the audience. And so th there are those three parts. You gotta get the image, you gotta be able to get images. And then you mm -hmm. go to be able to choose the best images for the perfect moment. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be able to reveal or convey or express. Mm -hmm. And that, that has to be through the somatic expression. Right? It has to be done through your body because that's the means, the medium of the right. art. Right. So, so one needs to train for each of these separate tasks right. to do that. So this goblet series is a, a guiding uh, prince, series of guiding principles of how to, to do that. Hmm. And you build the stem of the goblet through the psychophysical exercises, through learning how to expand and contract, mold, flow, fly, radiate, push, pull, fall, float, balance, how to hold the center, create an imaginary body, create atmospheres, personal and overall, find the psychological gestures, train your body to be able to utilize all the concepts and the principles. And learning the principles uh, is the part that helps you make those decisions mm -hmm. right, to choose, which one do I choose now? And you choose those according to universal principles. And the, um, the, the process of being able to access all of the potential images, what to choose from, comes from learning again all the techniques. They, every element on the chart could, you could say, is a leading question. It's uh, what, to what degree does this character expand and contract and when, and how is it different from mine? Mm -hmm. Where is the character center? How is it different from mine? And, uh, how does this character think? How do they express their feeling forces? How do they express their will forces? How are they different from mine? So it's a, a whole series of leading questions which provoke many possible answers. Yeah. And so, um, so the, uh, so working with these and becoming familiar, that builds your stem of, mm -hmm. and it starts to come up like this. And then when you, are applying these to a specific character, the, the bowl or the cup part of the goblet forms. Mm -hmm. And now it's ready to receive what comes down uh, from this unified sphere. And Chekhov in this um, image, he actually draws little stars, but he begins the whole thing with way up above a one single star mm. and that one single star is that spirit creative individual higher ego star mm. and um and when it when it starts to permeate it uh, and and we, you know we grow this stem up toward it and we open our arms to receive this inspiration it starts to help guide all these little beings, these little gold stars into, yeah. that, want, that are here for this particular artistic work. So it's this, this part is the specific use of the tool mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the STEM, which is the general development of your skill sets with the tools. Mm -hmm. um, when this happens, and I love this, I love this um, when, when it works, these spiritual inspirations you breathe you basically inhale your inspiration you exhale your expression mm -hmm. right um you you basically can inhale them and 
exhale them out into the into the artistic work and when you do he he his next image shows that the the arms of the goblet sort of start to glow ah <laughs> and then they radiate back up to these little spirit beings um like energetic food like manna <laughs> <laughs> right so these spirit beings that want to grow just as we want to grow, grow um, these spirit beings sort of get fed by us receiving them and giving them life. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a task to help support us, help humanity grow. And this Mr. Chekhov speaks about this theater of the future. And for me, that theater of the future is one that goes all the way back to the origins of theater, which were to unify the tribe, to uplift, unite, to educate. Mm -hmm. And once Mr. Chekhov had uh, his great spiritual trauma in um, 1917, 18, 19, during the midst of the Russian Revolution, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, he, he really went into a deep trauma about what the heck was the point of being a superstar with four hour curtain calls when people were killing themselves over loaves of bread and so this uh this trauma when he emerged from it uh, partly through hypnosis and partly through uptaking rudolf steiner's spiritual science he determined that he only wanted to do bring work into the world that was going to be spiritually uh, uplifting and important and uh, it, he had certain successes and certain failures with that uh, through the rest of his life but that became his overarching goal mm -hmm. and so as he's giving this information to the the um, actors in Latvia and Lithuania he was revealing this this concept and how important it it is for us to be working with these higher beings and helping communicate these higher concepts to humanity and um and so because basically explaining that we have a symbiotic relationship to help this grow and of course by through that process the power of this single your specific star your higher star ego is able to incarnate in you more fully and of course it's always fun to me that that we in uh, english call our great great artists stars oh, yeah. you know because there is this vibrant radiant shining that comes out of their art work mm -hmm. um that that really is uh replicating that now it's extremely important for me to note that by the time Michael Chekhov started teaching in England in 1936 and uh, that and and during 1935 36 when he was training his teachers that he changed this image mm -hmm. and it looks in uh, the book called uh, Michael Chekhov lessons for teachers I believe it is um, and there's a new publication of that out that is in English, German, and Russian. Um, this image, it now looks like a martini glass. It's a straight stick uh, figure, uh, just like a martini glass. And it's minus all the upper, um, all the information about the, the energy beings. And it's from that point forward, he... Um, he also no longer speaks publicly or writes publicly about what we call the sphere of images. Uh, he, he doesn't speak of a sphere uh, per se, which he spoke of in Russian. So um, I work with this image of this sphere that, that there's, there's this sphere he described as outside the earth's ozone lane, layer containing all the images. Uh, past, present, future, fiction, imaginary, everything lives in this higher sphere, what 
what I believe would, we would call the collective unconscious and is shared and accessible by everybody. All the archetypes living in there and the individual potential expressions of them, when we engage with them, uh, what the audience experiences is a blend of the pure image from this sphere and our creative individuality. Mm. So it's uh, always going to be this merging. So the, the ego, when he speaks where you said, Sara, is always going to shine through because it can't not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how clearly and how much sparkle or radiance it has depends on how willing the individual is to allow that themselves with a capital S mm -hmm. of selves to be fully revealed. Mm -hmm. So most of our lesser enjoyed acts acting is because the artist is literally blocking mm -hmm. an aspect of themselves. They're not, they, they're worried that a part of their lower self will be too ugly or inappropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, in, in these audio tapes, Mr. Chekhov refers to some of his colleagues who he just loves to go to dinner with and have great conversations because they're such full, rich, unique human beings. And then they get on the stage and they are just flat. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they're, they're removing uh, part of their their who who ness, if you will. That's a, a way to say it. Um, they're hiding it. They're not. Uh, they're trying to not let it be seen, and so it just kind of deadens the radi radiation. It's like uh, it has nothing to do with Chekhov, but the classic statement that you'll never truly be a great actor until you can stand naked on the stage. You know, I mean, it's it's a, a saying that's been heard, and we're not we're not literally talking physically naked um, because that can be done. Uh, people can literally stand physically naked and really be hiding mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, maybe even through their nakedness, they are able to hide their true mm -hmm. self-consciousness. So uh, it's a, it's a psycho spiritual nakedness. Yeah. Yeah. Openness is really what it means. So. Yeah. Um, as as you're talking about it, I'm I'm just really filled with how Jungian uh, this is. I mean, how depth psychologically um, parallel they are, and in, in, you know, in, in polarities, you know, in some some cases, talking about you know the image um, in the collective unconscious and accessing image. Um, you know, as, as Jungians, that's what we do. We work with image and we're taking image though from the lower, uh, well, uh, the lower piece, right? Talking about the unconscious, right? So images coming from dreams, from that collective unconscious, which is revealing itself slowly through, through dreams and what, what those images are that we can grab a hold of. And I think that that has that, that reveals that, um, uh, that truth and that openness that you're talking about in terms of being on stage. Um, in, in this case, it, it reveals the openness and truth that you're having inside of yourself. So I'm looking at it through that lens of, oh yes, if I, if I am this open here, then I can be, and I embrace this, I, I can be this open here because they parallel both back to image, um, which, we, which, we, which we work with. Yeah, yeah. And that um, goes back to what we were talking about, the uh, um, uh, uh, Pat Ogden's work mm -hmm. and the, the power gestures that I was talking about, the use of psychological gesture mm -hmm. where uh, the, uh, and, and where you started in the other talk about um, how our body contains these impressions um, and, and these memories and, uh, and the uh, by doing the the undone gesture, mm -hmm. uh, 
you are able to, in effect, rewire or reprogram the energetic flow through your body to develop a field of uh, capability of responsiveness mm -hmm. to future things that trigger, for example, that trigger this, you now learn to do this and do this safely and with power and authority. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that re retraining the physiology to be able to hold the unexpressed or disowned uh, energies mm -hmm. that have been eliminated from, from your range of expression as a human being and then, of course, as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talking about archetypes, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about the, the difference between the psychological gesture and the archetypal gesture that he talks yeah. about. Yes, yeah, so let me begin just by saying Mr. Chekhov uses the concept of archetypes uh, specifically um, multiple times, mm -hmm. right? So there are archetypal characters, there are archetypal gestures, there are archetypal atmospheres, archetypal scenarios even. So just as an example of this multiple use. So there's always a bit of a danger when someone in the Chekhov world isn't aware of this multiple use. And not everyone in the Chekhov world shares that clearly, that it, someone just starts talking about archetypes and you're not really sure what they're talking about. Um, and uh, so you get this sort of cross communication. So looking at the archetypal gesture specifically, we go back to the concept of gesture. And, and, and my recommendation is this very basic definition of gesture, which is a movement plus an intention. Mm -hmm. And without that intention, uh, we only have movement. So we have mold, we have moving like earth, water, air, and light. We have expanding and contracting, opening and closing, right? Um, once we add intent to it, we have uh, the will force. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that is, what is my will? What, what am I willing when I do this movement? And so that creates gesture. Without it, we just have sort of ballet. Uh, or boxing or what? Well, even in boxing, you have a will. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, basically a series of drills. Um, and, uh, and you haven't yet applied the, the, the how or the what. You know, what exactly are you doing when you do that? Um, and, and how do you do it? Mm -hmm. So when we... Uh, when we're building that stem of the goblet, we begin our first explorations of gesture with archetypal gesture, which is absent of the why, the reason, and it's absent of the how. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, what am I doing? I am, you know, I'm, I'm pushing, I'm pulling. So we start training with the most fundamental ones like we spoke of uh, in the last session where it's sort of what happens in the womb, it's what happens instinctively, it's archetypal because if we also look at the word archetype, we could say it's an overarching arch, archetype, arching um, or an umbrella idea or ideal expression. So it's a model and, uh, and when, so, so we learn the most basic primal impulses, the child has the impulse to push or to pull. And, um, and this is basically the impulse, the will to move something from the center to the periphery, you could say, which would be kind of be in the Laban-esque terms um, or from the periphery to the center pulling 
um, closing the space from the here or increasing the space. It's be a contraction again or an expansion. And we will see that all gesture is a variation of expanding and contracting. Uh, so now we're looking at from expanding and contracting being the most primal archetypal gesture to open, to close. We now move into why open, why close, to push or to pull. And then we can change the directional form of that and make it vertical from the horizontal plane. And we have to lift and to smash. And then we can put it again on this, this plane rather than, well, I, maybe this is called sagittal or, or whatever it is, a front, front back. Now we have around um, in, in this way. And, and from there we have what we could say throw and gather. So different Chekhov people use different things. It's important to note that uh, at least three different sources, uh, what is listed into the actor as gestures to do, what is listed in on the technique of acting, and what I have is a list from uh, Dorothy uh, Elmhurst, Beatrice Strait's mother who created the opportunity for him to teach at Darrington Hall. Mm -hmm. um, her list is, is different. So it's three lists that I have an example of. None of them are the same. Hmm. So there is absolutely nowhere in any of Mr. Chekhov's materials a definitive list of what the archetypal gestures are. Okay. And, um, and the way they were taught when I studied with the Dartington, uh, my Dartington Hall teachers, they basically said, you put your foot here, you put your hands here, you do, you transfer the weight like this, it goes like this. And they gave me a specific form. The teachers that I worked with in, from the Hollywood era, which is from the 40s into the, to 1955 when he died, um, uh, were, he, by then he gave a series of guidelines to meet and you would create your own form utilizing these guidelines. So uh, there were five primary ones that uh, essentially Jack Colvin really clarified for me and uh, that's it needed to be one full breath. It needed to be the full use of the body. It had to have extreme polarity it had to have 100% of your effort, and it had to have a preparation, an action, and a sustaining, and a stop. So the nature of, well, starting with the last one, preparation, action, sustain, stop. Uh, I call it pass, Pre prepare, act, sustain, stop, pass, the energy. So uh, all of the psychophysical exercises have that. They all have passed. They all need to be prepared. They need to be enacted and they need to be sustained, which creates the radiant star quality. And, um, and then this full use of the breath. So the gesture lasts the duration of one inhale and one exhale. Mm -hmm. and the inhale is, the preparation is on the inhale. Mm -hmm. And in that preparation, you move to the polar point that you're going to end at so if you're in push if you're going to end in push with your weight fully forward you're going to start on your inhale by going from center into your backspace mm -hmm. as far into your backspace as you can go without losing balance where you can literally begin to push and you push all the way from one extreme all the way through to the other and you sustain it Mm. Um, and while Mr. Chekhov has talks about a feeling of ease everywhere, um, what he means is that you need to be able to put 100% of your effort, which is physical tension in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, easily. Like a boxer needs to easily access 100% of their physical effort in an instant on the ring of a bell and release it mm. uh, using it 
at maximum efficiency, which is what all peak performing does, it uses energy in maximum efficiency. You learn to turn it on and you learn to turn it off, but you learn to go from zero to a hundred in an inhale. Mm -hmm. So that your exhale has its full force behind it. And it continues beyond the physical expression because you're always working with the etheric body, the energy body, the kinesphere mm. of energy, which of course travels beyond. Mm. So the archetypal gesture, um, like for me, the most primal, like pure primes are those, those basic six in relation to the directions. It's, mm. you could say expanding and contracting in specific directions. Um, push, pull, lift, smash, gather, throw. And um, throw really could be separate. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a, a, but throw continuously shows up. Sometimes separate, separate also shows up. Um, and gather, some people think is a pull. Uh, but there is something about gather which has this energy, which uh, act, seems to activate a different part of the being than, than, than this energy, whether it's pulling down, pulling up, pulling in from the side. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, in effect, if we go back to our deep archetypes of gatherers and hunters, yeah. Um, we, our deep archetypes are not pullers, they're gatherers. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, drag uh, was one of Jack Colvin's that he insisted was a core. And I mm -hmm. thought that was just a pull. Mm -hmm. uh, so out of it, I, because uh, I didn't want to make him wrong, I want to make all my teachers right. Uh, <laughs> I, I said, what can, how could I do drag that would not that would offer me something I'm not discovering through pull. And so from drag, I, I started dragging from the backspace, dragging, mm -hmm. reaching behind me and dragging. And I created what I experienced as a counter gesture. So I really experienced something sort of pulling me back as I tried to drag it forward. Mm -hmm. That gave me something unique and um, reach is another that I like on the list. And reach for me is kind of like a stem cell. It's sort of like the beginning of everything. Yeah. yeah. It's the beginning of to push, to pull. You reach back, you reach forward, you reach down, you reach up to smack, you know, whatever it is, there it begins. Um, it can begin with that reach, you could say that desire, that yearning. Mm. And, um, and then, Two others that I like uh, to add are penetrate, mm -hmm. uh, often on the list, to penetrate. And to penetrate, to me, is a push into. Mm -hmm. So this push into is a very focused push and very useful and extremely useful for actors because a lot of actors think their objective is to understand. I just, mm -hmm. my character just wants to understand. But understand uh, any verb that's not gesturable is hard to perform. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, so to understand, if you literally <clears throat> go under and then stand, it's actually trying to penetrate. Mm -hmm. uh, to understand is a penetration. And so to penetrate the mind, um, for example, but to, to uh, seduce can be a penetration. Um, to to uh, get into like every thief is trying to get into the right. building right <laughs> and reach for the the goods and then gather them and then pull them to them uh, so to penetrate every you know sorority girl is trying to get into the and you know every frat guy and uh, people tr you know politicians trying to penetrate the the mines and the the voting machines. Um, all so to penetrate is a very functional <laughs> gesture, and uh, and then the tenth one is um, once we're in, we want to separate or tear. Uh, so 
so to, to tear, which to me is two pulls apart. Mm. And <clears throat> closely, closely related to throw, and some people might prefer to put tear up in that first set of six. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's no check off police. Right. <laughs> usefulness and functionality is infinitely more important than following somebody's set specific list. I just, I have those 10 uh, because I think those six that I mentioned are pure uh, primary colors. You know, if there's a, a red, a blue, and a yellow of archetypal gesture, it is push, pull, lift, smash, gather, throw. And then if there's an orange and a purple and a green, you know, that's penetrate and it's um, uh, tear and drag as variations of um, push and pull and, uh, and, and uh, push and pull. And reach as that stem cell is, um, is, the, is like the pure, uh, stimulation, the most pure stimulation of an emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to commenting about gesture because it's a movement plus an intention always has the possibility of succeeding or failing. Mm -hmm. Without the possibility of winning or losing when doing the gesture, succeeding or failing, succeeding wonderfully or failing horribly, you don't, uh, you have useless gesture and reach is the most viscerally triggering. Mm. When someone was reaching for something, whether it's a teacher trying to reach the, the minds of the student mm. or, or, or the thief is this far away from getting the, you know, the jewel, the emotions mm. uh, that are attached to being almost there or way far away or having achieved it mm -hmm. are so quickly triggered the, mm -hmm. the the delight and the despair of success and failure are very very visceral so reach is just it, it's kind of I, I say if you had to do an audition and you didn't have time to figure out what the objectives and goals and gestures actually were just do reach <laughs> <laughs> They're reaching for power. They're reaching, you know, for all Maslow's hierarchical needs. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they are reaching for identification for social structures. They're reaching for money, greed, what power, identity, uh, comfort, social, um, social standing. You know, they're reaching. So, uh, so it's a a, a cure all or quick you know, resolution. So the purpose of the archetypal gesture is a, tr it is a training technique only. Okay. And that's a major distinction between it and the psychological gesture as a training only technique. It is designed to do what we were speaking about as reawaken or break down any resistance in the psychosomatic being of the artist to that uh, impulse. So I'll give you an example. I had an actress who was a, a pusher. She was just so fantastically super dynamic and she, um, uh, she just was doing way, way too much. You know, she was in grad school and she was having a successful acting career and she was taking additional professional classes and working. Mm. and uh and she just was unstoppable and she could when when we started to learn push man, like that she could push when we learned pull she couldn't even and she's an athlete she couldn't even stay on balance with pull wow. she couldn't understand it she just physically could not do pull mm. and so i was like this is major for you and I want you to really work on this. And she came back to the next class and she went, you know, people will help you if you ask them. <laughs> and I, you know, it, it, 
that's a game changer in a psychology. You yeah. Know? I can imagine that this, this gal grew up in an environment where she had no one to depend on and no one to turn to. Yeah. And she had a huge independent streak and I will do this and I don't care. Nobody's going to stop me. It's fierce forward moving will. Mm. And, uh, but, but taught T A U T taught that kind of taught. Yeah. Um, she was wired uh, in that forward motion so much so that when we tried to get her to go this direction, she literally couldn't find her balance. And so, you know, just over a week, she was able to work with it and she was able to perceive a new world and ask for help. And that will increase her feeling of ease Mm -hmm. and therefore her expressivity. Now, if an actor never learns how to do an archetypal gesture that they've disowned from their being, they will never choose that for their characters. And so they will only ever actually be successful playing those aspects of themselves. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to play, for example, she wouldn't be able to successfully play that vulnerable part where the victim needs to ask for help. Mm -hmm. She will always be able to play the power uh, detective, the power businesswoman but she'll never play the aspiring intern who makes a mess of things. Right. Said another guy who was absolutely massive and, um, but had this very meek voice and he was making his living as an extra. And he was very frustrated because he'd go on the set and he'd be auditioned on the set to play a bodyguard or to play, you know, because he was this, he looked like Mr. Clean and uh, in terms of a body build, just, and, um, and, and, but he never got, never got the parts. And when I was trying to teach him smash, I said, I want you to smash me. And he was like, Oh, I can't do that. You're my teacher. I would never want to hurt you. And I was like, you know what? I can't teach you anymore unless you smash me because your career depends on you. it. <laughs> ability to smash. And it was our last class because by the end of it, he learned how to smash me. And the following week he had to cancel because he got a part on a soap opera as a security guard. And then that started to recur. And over the next year, he got six commercials playing police officers, security guards, things like that. And he got uh, six movies of the week. Wow. All, he got commercials. He got a running gig on a soap opera. He got these movies. And I mean, and he started making a living as an actor. So, you know, it's like, that's it. It's all he needed to learn from me was smash because it was part of his physical archetype yeah. of, of his casting, which is again, using archetype as a, as a character rather than a gesture. Mm-hmm. So once we, so once we get through those core archetypal gestures and the actor knows how to safely um, express them with, uh, uh, without, uh, express them objectively. Mm-hmm. Um, then we need to learn how to express them subjectively, which means to smash ferociously, mm. uh, which means, but also to to use smash with like you look smashing today, mm. right? Um, to throw a compliment. Mm. Uh, you know, to pitch an idea, mm. uh, to gather thoughts or to strangle, right? Which is uh, gather, strangle, choke, mm. ring is another, so just a variation of gather, right? Mm. Um, uh, these are, uh, you know, to, to hug, to embrace. These are all gathers. So mm. when you start changing the, you know, why uh, what you're doing is gathering. Why are you doing it to choke? Mm. Why are you doing it to comfort? Mm. This is where the psychology starts to come in to the gesture and you're adding what was the will, you're adding to it a reason Mm -hmm. and you're adding to it a half. So the reason is the thinking force 
and the how is the feeling force and the, that basic action that what is the action it is the will force so if archetypal gesture is will and movement right intent plus movement the psychological gesture adds the thinking force and the feeling forces so again going back to psyche psychological Chekhov talks about going to the soul the soul forces are the thinking feeling and willing forces mm -hmm. so the psyche logical gesture are the thinking feeling willing forces mixed with the the gesture with the movement so and the instant you take an archetypal gesture and you put it into context mm -hmm. it automatically gains the reason it's being done and guides you with the how it should be done all application of gesture is psychological gesture should be should be. Going to be powerful <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah and and if a care if an actor is playing the character and does an archetypal push within their performance the audience will perceive it as coming from that character's psychology mm -hmm. it, it, it will automatically become a psychological gesture they will they will see or sense maybe they won't be able to cognize or you know verbalize what what they're experiencing but they will through mirror neurons do uh, do some aspect of the gesture or react yeah in couch in, in polarity to you know they'll they'll experience the gesture being done to them mm. or experience themselves doing doing the gesture in their mirror mirroring process great yeah. thank you so much what a rich <laughs> conversation <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that you you were talking about um in our first uh, in your opening on our first session or really was the uh, sort of the health impact i think mm -hmm. um that different techniques have um because of the fact that that actors are playing in this field of um psychological and emotional um, depth mm -hmm. and this um, we talked about this distinction between reality and pretend mm -hmm. um, the nature of working with Michael Chekhov's work as a pretend based approach that um, any safest and pretend actors and there there are many many safest and pretend actors who are shamed out of their their joy so when they discover michael chekhov they often say i used to do this mm -hmm. um, you know because mr chekhov's work is all based on um not him making things up but him observing what happens instinctively and intuitively Mm -hmm. so identifying energy patterns that are already present not making up and imposing them but ones that are already present in peak performances and just identifying them and creating exercises by which we could have a means to access those on command mm -hmm. so the the wonderful thing about uh somebody who's in safest in reality uh this, take for example my security guard let's just say he was i never tested him muscle <laughs> kinesiology muscle testing to help someone find out but let's say he was um he he had one could imagine because of his massive size and stuff like that that he had adopted this soft voice so he wouldn't be so intimidating mm -hmm. so this is my back chair psychology <laughs> um but let's say that that's the case and so every time he tried to play someone of high levels of authority intimidating uh, and fully embodying his power he felt a sense of shame uh, he, he might have felt a sense of shame for uh and, and a sense of rejection mm -hmm. which would not allow him to fully express that so uh 
every time he imagined, would imagine himself or try to recall, let's say, if he needed to be in reality, he had to recall a time when he was in high level of authority, that level of that recall would produce such a feeling of shame that he couldn't play the role. Mm -hmm. So he could now, he can now actually have a recall of the exercise. Mm -hmm. And he now has a memory mm -hmm. uh, that he generated during the training that he can go and recall to. If a person needs to create and operate through recall, mm -hmm. uh, if they feel the need to work their art that way, then they have, uh, they can create the actual, they can safely and artistically create the memory mm -hmm. that they can call upon. Uh, we spoke last time about the, um, person who needs to work out of recall when they don't have sufficient negative energies to or experiences to recall on will unconsciously drive themselves to create it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you know this you spoke about the high rate of suicide and uh among artists uh, being four times the the average um we we have a um culture that propagated this idea that the artist must be starving and hungry in order to be true mm -hmm. and that manifest in the in the effective memory recall process where you truly needed to have low self-esteem or you need to experience abuse or you need to you need to have those problems for real in order to be able to perform them so now you can heal those through the technique and you can recall uh for example what you can you can look at that memory and analyze it according to the tools on the technique so you can say gosh when i was in that state of terror i was very contracted i was pulling in uh and I was, uh, the, the tempo in the room was this, the atmosphere was like that. And someone was coming at me with a major push, you know, or they were penetrating me with a knife, trying to penetrate me with a knife. You can look at it and, um, and identify the elements through the artist's eye. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore you don't actually have to dig into your subconscious and stir the memory. You can leave the memory honored and it, and in many cases it will actually, without even aiming to, it will harmonize and balance and de, uh, defuse the power, the negative power of that, of that. So, you know, and, and you learn through the process, you no longer need to have real memories because you can create uh, you need, need no longer need to have memories, painful memories that come out of life because you can create artistically real memories in your training mm -hmm. to resource. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the Meissner work where uh, you're removing the filter of your everyday personality and, and revealing uh, spontaneously based on just what your partner's getting. Mm -hmm. Uh, giving. I mean, you're, you're focused fully on your partner and what they're giving you and you're in reaction to. Mm -hmm. So acting as reacting. Mm -hmm. And through the checkoff technique, you can now imagine, um, but you can, you can really relate to imaginary stimuli. So mm -hmm. now when you're facing an, uh, a um, casting director, and uh, having learned how to be immediately responsive, you're facing a casting director who's reading quite neutrally to you. Mm -hmm. um, instead of you having nothing to respond to, mm -hmm. you can really respond because your concentration is so clear to your image of what ideally you'd be getting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this will carry forward onto a film set or into a your monologue on the stage or soliloquy on the stage where on the film set you you have to have that dynamic interaction with little x on the wall mm -hmm. you know or you're on a green screen and somebody's standing there with a broom that with a stick and sign on it says hulk you know um 
And so much of our uh, performing material these days is unnatural. Mm -hmm. It is sci-fi, it's future, it's horror, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's mystical, it's uh, cartoony, it, it, it's so many unreal. And even when Broadway was open, you had about a 50% chance of not being a human on Broadway. You know, you could be a choo-choo train or, or a teapot, you yeah. know? So, um, uh, so, so look, learning, uh, if you prefer a reality based technique, uh, you're, you, if you don't learn how to work out of a more expansive mm -hmm. and psychophysical world, your ability to really shine in these non-human roles uh, will be limited. So you, 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 there's a good reason to, to engage in a, um, uh, in a psychophysically expansive balancing, human balancing uh, process. It yeah. gives you more areas to be employed successfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for reaching out to, to me. And Thank you help. so much for your time. And this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it.